Good morning. Welcome to worship at St. Martin's this morning. It's great to be back from study leave and be home again. It's been, it was a long, long go, but I learned lots. The learning was rich, and I'm, I'm so blessed to have your support in being able to do that, and I'll be uh, talking more about that in the days and weeks to come. Um, it, was just, it's, it was just great, and I'm so glad to be home. Um, so, St. Martin's is an affirming congregation of the United Church of Canada, and as such, we strive to welcome everyone into our midst. Our uh, motto is, uh, <clears throat> children welcome noise expected, and so if you have children here, they are welcome to be part of the congregation and to part of the worship. Um, there is a nursery available as well if you, if you prefer that, so please take, take your children down there if that's what you'd like. Um, the blue ribbons, we have blue ribbons. There's some, a number of us that are wearing those, including Seth. There he is. Um, so Seth and, and everyone here is going to uh, be able to answer your questions if you're new in the congregation and able to uh, and have some questions, we'll be able to answer those. And so please go to those folks and they will help you. So we're very glad that you're joining us this morning and I'm particularly pleased to be leading worship with the uh, group of uh, young people and leaders that went to uh, Mexico this um, February. It was a wonderful experience and that you're gonna hear all about that during worship. So I'd like to, them to stand and I'll just introduce them. You have to turn around people. <laughs> so on the end is Tori, and Carrie, and Brenda, and Seth, and Mary, and Harry, and the back row over here is Lauren, there she is, and Bryn, and Sophia, and Isabel, and Simon. And uh, we're also missing one of our members this morning, Brody, who wasn't able to be with us, so we remember him this morning as we do this. Good morning. Uh, we're, we'll light, ask Bryn to light our candle this morning. Loving God as the light from this candle comes to us. May the blessings of the risen Christ come to us as well, warming our hearts and brightening our way. May the light of Jesus Christ bring life into all of the dark places of this world and to us as we seek to know him and walk in his way. Here we go. Please join uh, Lauren and I in our responsive invitation to worship this morning. Around the globe, God's people gather today. On this Sunday, we gather to worship a small part of a worldwide communion of believers. We speak the words in different languages. Our understandings are different too. Yet we are more the same than different. Created in the image of God, we are all made good and treasured by our Creator. Across many time zones, let us worship in unity, peace, and joy. We are blessed to be together, one people of God. Please join us in prayer. Loving Creator, you touch our lives with mystery and hope. We come to this place today ready to see your power working through us. Help us as we listen to the witness of our young people today to be open to your word and to answer your call among us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Micah 6, 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that you saw hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it then we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. 
So for the next few minutes, we're going to ask the participants to talk a little bit about what this experience was like for them. And we're going to do that in a couple of different ways. But before we do that, I just wanted to, for those of you who don't know, we, we took this trip in February for, uh, I guess, 12 days in total. Um, we were actually in Mexico for 10. And um, we had a wide variety of experiences, which we're certainly not able to relate to you this morning. Um, if you are able to stay or happen to bring your lunch at 12.30, the participants are going to be doing another session, and each of them will get an opportunity to tell you about that experience. But if you're not able to stay, please engage them in the lounge after worship, and they will certainly uh, give you the, uh, the benefit of their knowledge and what they've experienced. Um, the three of us that were uh, adult accompaniers, I don't like chaperones somehow, because um, we didn't feel like we chaperoned. We, we actually uh, you know, we were there to help uh, young folks engage, and that they did. Uh, we were entirely blessed the whole time with this group of, of young people who were thoughtful and emotional and completely engaged in everything that they participated in and, and heard and saw. So without me talking anymore, I want to give uh, Isabel first an opportunity to uh, talk a little bit about what she experienced. Okay, so my name's Isabel and I go to St. Martin's United Church. And I decided to talk about one of my joys of the trip, one of my challenges, and how we felt uh, close to God. There are so many people in Mexico who are filled with generosity, but none so much as Alfonso, the priest at the only LGBTQ church in the state of Morelos. This man was amazing. He was passionate about giving others an open place to stay and to help those uh, who others viewed as outsiders. He had a place for those dying from AIDS to stay and cared for each and every one of them as if they were his family. When he talked to us, there was humbleness in his story. He told us about how the stress of all of the outside pressure and the stories of the people he had helped had almost killed him, but by some miracle he had survived an operation to his stomach and he went back to his work with the same enthusiasm knowing that God had sent him to do this mission. Alfonso was gentle, kind, he told his story with a smile, knowing that we were there to listen. We left feeling bittersweet, knowing that there's only one place that accepts all from the LGBTQ spectrum in the whole state is tough. But there is so much goodness coming from this one place that it gave us hope, that even one place is so much better than nothing, and that Alfonso is the perfect saintly man to do the job. My low point for me was a surprise. It didn't come from the first days, the shock of what happens in the country or Canada's involvement, although those were all challenges for me and still are. My low point was on the second last day, walking through the square. There was a building off to one side, and as we walked past it, we noticed that there were pictures of young, young people along it. Christina, told us, uh, Christina, our guide, told us that there were, the pictures were of the people who had gone missing, and that there was a bus of 43 students that had just completely disappeared, and that their bodies had still yet to be found. That when people went looking for the students, they instead found 60 mass burial sites that have no traces of their children, and that they don't know who's buried there. That this kind of news is horrifying, yet passes unseen in the lives of those unaffected by it, such as us with our privileged lives in Canada. And that even knowing what has happened, that there's not much that I, a 17-year-old girl from Canada, can do about it but I can spread the news to others, which is exactly what I'm doing with God's help. This whole trip, God was near, watching over us. But there were moments when God felt especially close. One such moment was on the seventh day. We had gotten back from a long day of painting the preschool and visiting the ruins, and we were exhausted. That was the day we got roses for the kitchen staff, and we learned that in Mexico, the flowers may be cheap, but they are also not dethorned. That evening, we went onto the roof and played card games and showed each other, let's face it, bad magic tricks. Uh, God was close in the bonds that brought us together in those short 10 days. In that evening of cheesy coin tricks and dis the distant boom of fireworks going off in the distance. In the thorns of the roses and in the joy on the faces of our wonderful kitchen ladies. In the distant dogs barking. God was everywhere on that trip, but in those moments, they were especially close. There is sadness in Mexico. There's poverty, tragedy, injustice, and pain. But with those extremes comes the other side, 
The love, community, and kindness that runs through the lives of those living there is unparalleled. Despite the challenges, there's a joy that comes with the simple fact of living and of having each other. We certainly felt that community in every person that we met and in all of those who went on this life-changing experience. What if I told you there is an entire village of starving, underweight children? What if I told you there is an entire village of people without adequate water supply, drinking water they knew contained poisons, but they drink it anyway because they have no other choice? Some people might think, well, that's too bad, but it's not really our, my problem. But it is our problem, and it should be our problem. We have the power and the means to make a change in this world if only we open our hearts to see it. While we were in Mexico, we visited many cities and homes, but one village in particular stuck with me, Tlamacazapa, people of fear. This is an unorganized village on the side of a mountain created when the people fled from the Spanish 500 years ago. This village struggles greatly with poverty. They don't have enough money to put in a proper plumbing system. On average, each house uses 1.1 liters of water a day. I can't even imagine only using that much. I mean, I probably use more than that with be within the first hour of being awake. But it isn't so easy for them to all get access for water. All we have to do is turn on a tap if we want it. But they have to walk up and down the incredibly steep streets of their village while carrying a heavy pail just to survive. We had the chance to walk up these roads. We only had to do it once without carrying anything, and my legs were on fire. The people that we visited live with almost nothing. They do whatever they can to make ends meet, whether that's selling bracelets in the market, hoping enough to make enough money that day to eat, or selling baskets, praying that somebody will buy one. They do whatever they can, but they didn't, know, they didn't always have enough to put food on the table, but they were always so kind and generous, despite living in extreme poverty. I will never forget how welcoming those families were, how eager they were to tell us their stories. I always heard about places in the world that are poverty stricken, but I never truly heard those stories, not until now. Not until seeing the faces of the children who called this place home. Not until seeing firsthand how hard their life truly is. The memory of visiting Tulema Kazapa is one that I will carry with me forever and has definitely changed my perspective on the world. So um, I'm Carrie, and I had the privilege of being uh, one of the chaperones on this trip with these 10 amazing youths that we took with us. Um, we're going to change up the presentation style a little bit, and I'm going to prompt these three uh, f to tell you some of their stories. We really could talk forever about all the experiences that we had, so we'll try and keep it to our favorite and the most memorable. Uh, let's introduce yourselves first. Uh, so I'm Tori Robertson, and I'm 16 years old, and I come to St. Martin's. Uh, I'm Harry Cook. I'm 15, and I come to St. Martin's. I'm Mary Pia. I'm 17 years old, and this is my church, too. Um, and so one of the things that we did when we were in Mexico was every night we had a, a debrief where uh, both the students and the adults got to share their joys and their challenges of the day in addition to our night prayer. Um, so we're going to kind of choose our uh, most poignant joy and challenge to tell you about. So let's start with our challenges. So I think my challenge, my most, I don't know what I'm trying to say, my greatest challenge of the trip was almost every house in Cuernavaca had roofing called asbestos. And asbestos is a cancer-causing material. And... Um, Everyone has that roofing because it's the cheapest roofing that they can buy, and it's actually illegal in Canada, I believe. Uh, one challenge that I had was, uh, for, well, for one of the days, we went to an orphanage, and all they really had there was uh, a broken down basketball hoop and then a couple of deflated balls to play with. But even though they had that, they were always so happy, and as you can see there, that's me and I think my sister running around with them and on our backs. So they were always really happy and eager to have fun. And yeah. Um, one of my challenges was um, we went to go visit families and other houses and hear their stories. And in every single 
house, there was a TV, but every family told us that they didn't have enough money to buy food to have three meals a day, or sometimes not even have a meal a day. But the reason why they had TVs is because their government, government made it a priority for every single house to have a TV so they can put propaganda up to tell them that they're living in a beautiful place and a safe place when actually they're censored and don't know what's going on and all the bad things that happen or are aware of stuff. Uh, what was communicating like with some of the people that you encountered? Uh, communication was pretty difficult because not many of them spoke English. Some spoke a little bit. But uh, we had a translator who came along with us everywhere we went. Uh, it was especially hard to translate with the children because like, the children would be coming up to us and talking to us while the parents were telling their story. So our translator couldn't translate what the kids were saying to us. So that was pretty difficult. Harry, what was playing with the kids like when you didn't speak the same language? Uh, well, it was a lot more like physical playing rather than like jokes or anything like that because you really couldn't understand each other. Like we didn't understand Spanish, they didn't really understand English. So it was all, a lot of like tickling, running around, just that kind of stuff. Good. Yeah. And then uh, Mary, why don't you start with your joy? One of the highlights of your trip for you. Okay, one of the highlights was probably just meeting all the people because every time we met somebody or went to go visit them, they would be very happy and smiling and always be like, if you ever come back in this area, just remember there's open arms and there's a house for you to stay at. Even though their house was really crowded or they didn't have enough room, they always said, we'd love to see you again. And they just loved sharing their stories with us and having us to listen to them. And it was really nice to see the joy of us just being there to hear the stories. And then with the kids, it was really fun because in this one place in Lama Kazapa, this one house had about like 10 kids and they just loved playing with us. Like they poked us, teased us, tickled us, and we had like a major tickling war. And they actually like followed us to the other house, just like wanting us to stay. So that was fun. Uh, my challenge goes along with my joy, or my joy goes along with my challenge twice in a row. Uh, but I really liked hanging out with the kids because it was a lot, like it was a different uh, view because they were a lot more happy. They were always excited. They were like, oh yeah, let's run, even though they didn't have anything to do, like they didn't have any phones or computers or anything like that. They just had whatever they had, that's what they wanted to use and that's what they wanted to have like for you. And that just really kind of made me feel how privileged I am. Yeah, definitely my greatest joy of the trip was seeing how happy everyone was even with uh, what little they had. And what about, Terry, tell us a little bit about when we went to the orphanage, you had brought a few things to give to the kids, but they also had some things they wanted you to do with them. Yeah, um, so at the orphanage, there were a few kids. I think most of them were at school, so there wasn't as many as we expected. But I had brought some balloons and some glow sticks and beads and to make bracelets. And as soon as I brought them out, all the kids just gathered around and they were opening the bags and they were all taking them and they started making it. And um, they wanted help with homework. Like my tran our translator obviously helped me figure out what they were tr telling me. And so they brought textbooks up to me and they were telling me, you know, I need to do this and this and this. And I, they opened up the textbook and they were showing me what questions they had to do. And I was just staring at them and I was like, I have no idea what any of this says because it was all in Spanish. So it was really difficult. Yeah. Um, what was one thing that you brought back? Each of you can contribute to this as well. One thing you brought back or that you experienced that changed your perspective or your views now that you're home? Uh, what I brought back was I definitely am a lot I'm very privileged. I have a lot more than I thought I had, so I'm really going to keep that in my heart. Uh, just like with Tori, she said uh, she has a lot already, and that's what I was thinking. Like, because before I would always complain, like, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that. This is like so new. I want this, but now I just like feel like, oh yeah, I don't need any of that because it's not really important. Like, if I have good friends, family, that's all that really matters. And also, one thing that I really uh, am enjoying now that I'm back is having car space. <laughs> because, uh, 
Why? Why, Harrison? Tell us why. Uh, <laughs> while we were there, we uh, only had one van to fit all of all ten of us. Three, thirteen, ten. Thir yeah, ten passenger van, ten uh, youth, three adults, and then the driver. And, yeah, and then anyone else that came with us. So we had to fit, fit 16 people into a 10-person van. We had to sit on the tires. It was very interesting. But it was safe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Harry and I were the lucky ones that got to sit on the tires. <laughs> Mary, something you brought back that changed you or changed um, your perspective? What I brought back is kind of just... so. At, so we went during the February break, and then during the Easter break, I actually went on a trip to Italy with my school group, and it was just a very different kind of sense and feeling, because it was for more tourism. But like when I was there, I kind of just remembered like when we went shopping, it was kind of just like, oh, I should go to the vendors opposed to the stores, because I learned that in Mexico, they rely on tourism a lot, and it really hurts them when on the news it says it's a dangerous place and then less tourists go because then they lose money and they can't sell to people so then they just have less than they actually already have. So when I was there it's kind of just like I just realized and understood how much tourism meant to vendors. Great. So we've covered barely the surface of, of our trip. We didn't tell you about the, what we did at the, the preschool. We missed the water park. We didn't talk about Tlama very much. We didn't talk about our hike to Tepetzland. So we'll try and cover some more of this after the service if you'd like to stay. Thank you for listening. Thanks, guys. I'd like to just introduce Brenda Curtis. Um, Brenda and I worked for, I guess, about two years um, before the trip actually happened. And um, most of you know that I'm in a diaconal training program through the United Church of Canada, and Brenda is my diaconal mentor. So it was really wonderful to work with her and to see her passion for Mexico. And she's going to just give a brief introduction to our Minute for Mission today. Thank you, Keith. 70% of the people live in poverty in Mexico. And out of those 70%, uh, probably more than half of those live in extreme or abject poverty, as we would say. Irma is one of those people. Irma lives uh, near Cuernavaca, the city. She lives in a ravine that runs through the city in a squatter's area. And it had come to the attention of the people at Quest Mexico that Irma needed some help for her and her family. And so one of the things that the team has decided to do is to put forth an effort to try to help Irma to uh, provide safer housing and accommodation and environment for her family. This is Irma's story.
Loving God, today we pray for all the people of Mexico, the families and children of a country where so many are struggling under the heavy burdens of poverty, oppression, and violence. We pray for the staff at Quest Mexico, for Gerardo and his family who hosted us while we were there, for all the people we met during our time in February, those who shared their stories, those who looked after us so generously out of the little that they had, for those who laughed with us and danced with us, and those who challenged our thinking and our perceptions of the world. For the Women's Center and the Community School in La Estación, and for Casa Hogar Orphan Orphanage, where we did some of our service work, for the many people we worked with, the community members and others who came and took part in helping and encouraging us. Today we pray also for the members of Team Mexico who participated in this life-changing program, for those who made this experience possible for us, for all the past participants of this program and for those who may take part in the future, for all, for all who have been given an incredible gift through this experience and whose stories may change the way we see others in the world. God, we also ask for your prayers and for your presence in this community of faith, for those that are in need of your presence today. We remember particularly Zoe Temple, Pat Stewart, George Christensen, Iris Clark, Ivy Gunderson, and Laura Scott. May, you feel that may they feel your presence and your blessing. God, we give all of who we are and all of what we have been part of here today. We give all of this and more into your loving hands, and we ask you that you continue to work through us to make the world just a little kinder and a little better place for all people. Please join with me in a responsive adaptation of the Lord's Prayer created in Latin in Central America. Our God who is with us and within us here on earth, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Let us do your will. You are giving us our daily bread. Forgive us. And don't let us fall into the temptation. But deliver us from the evil that disunites us. which is built with us and through us forever and ever. Amen. Let it be so. I'd like Isabel to come up, if you don't mind, Isabel. We'd like to um, offer some um, gratitude to you, the Congregation of St. Martin's, for your support. Um, each of, uh, many of you individually supported us financially, and we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that. We also want to acknowledge the UCW of St. Martin's and the contemporary singers who gave us large amounts towards this, this trip, and we are very grateful. Um, we, I'll get you to get that if you don't mind. Uh, we picked out a gift in the market in Kernavaca for you uh, that we'll have uh, hold, well, we held in the, in the sanctuary once I iron it. <laughs> it was in Carrie's luggage when it came and uh, it kind of got munched up a bit, but um, this is a gift um, f on behalf of team uh, to the, the, the uh, congregation of St. Martin's and we'd like Donna uh, as the board chair to come up and receive this um, as a gift from us. See if I can do better this time. I have to say, the first, at the first service, we made the same presentation. I was absolutely overwhelmed. Um, thank you to Team Mexico for um, sharing with us a little bit of your trip. And I'm looking forward to staying at 1230 and hearing more about it. Um, what a rich experience. And there's so much we could say, but please stay and, and join the team afterwards. And so let us go out into the world, remembering. Remembering who we are, remembering whose we are. 
Let us go out into the world to love, cherish, and nurture all whom we meet, all of God's creation. Let us go with God's blessings. May grace, mercy, and peace be with us all this day.